Hey, thanks for watching that video. I really appreciate you checking out my music. If you made it this far, you probably are either really nerdy and interested in synths or really interested in the music. Either way, I really appreciate it. I thought I would start doing a thing at the end of my videos where I could break down exactly what components make up the song, what details, you know, even if you're familiar with music or modular synthesizers, you know, you can come here and look at this pile of cables and think, I don't really know what went into that. I can appreciate it, but you might appreciate the details even more behind the scenes as to what made up that. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. I have a couple of things, basically a, a small modular synth setup. If you're not familiar, this is called a Eurorack synth that's made up of individual modules. Each of them either make sounds or control sounds in different ways. Uh, and this thing called a Scorp Hermit is my sequencer, it basically sends the notes out to everything. I have a few other specific synths here. I have the Moog Grandmother, a Dave Smith Tetra, and a Roland Juno um, that make up the song. So a lot of my compositions recently, because I have such a small Eurorack setup, is a combination of you know Eurorack, the sequencer, and you know these actual MIDI synthesizers, which can give a pretty full sound. I feel like I really kind of dig the ability to make these unique glitchy sounds and also have more traditional synth sounds coming from these guys. Um, yeah, so the Hermit is an 8-track sequencer. It can get even more detailed than that. It's got 8 CV outs and 8 gate outs. Um, 
you can even sequence gates separately from LFOs and other things and it can get really complex, but I'll walk you through each sound, you know, one through eight kind of as I did them. The first sound is actually coming out of this thing called a Scorp. Um, that's the company that makes it, the same people that make this one. Uh, the Scorp Rample, which I recently just got, and kind of the basis of this track was I just figured out how to get their Volt per octave setting working, which means tracking with keys, you know, I can program in what pitch each sample is sounding at. So it does multiple samples. Um, I guess I can skip ahead and do the boring ones. Track five is just a kick drum. Uh, six is a snare drum. And then here is using a uh, Euclid effect, doing a little pattern on a hi hatty sound, which is track three. All those are coming gate outputs of that into here, and it actually leaves the uh, CV outputs open for LFOs or other things, which is totally cool. So, kind of three drum sounds on track five through seven. The interesting part, which is kind of the basis for this track, was uh, sa sample four, voice four, I don't really know what to call it, of the Rample. I kind of loaded my own samples. Those drum samples were from the Rample into my computer, processed, and put back on here through an SD card. And uh, the cool part, you probably heard that loop at the beginning. And that's actually my Rhodes here. I had played a song along to those drum samples, and I kind of broke them out, uh, cut them up, and re-put them back in the Rample to try to do a unique thing. So I played the Rhodes here. I don't think I have it hooked up right now. Recorded it and put it back here. So I have a few samples that are there. This Korg SQ1 down here uh, is hooked up. So it does do playback. Oh, not playback. This top row is going to control what uh, the glitch input is. So you can kind of hear it. these two steps are glitchier than others. And that's actually coming here off this thing called a trigger man. So it's a pattern, so sometimes it sticks on certain patterns longer than others. So you kind of have this irregular glitchy pattern happening when I turn that on in the song. And it actually will track volts per octave, so... So you heard it go down, there's actually a two octave range, and when you break it, it kind of drops the octave, so the ramp will can go two octaves. So in the future, hopefully I can get even more funky with that, find more cool patterns. Um, in this one, I mostly stayed on this C. and just had little accents, you know, a fifth up or a fourth up, um, depending. That's kind of that first sound. Uh, the second one is just this Roland Juno. A simple little pad. That comes in every 16 beats or something. It's pretty repetitive. I probably could have done a little bit more with the pad, but I just wanted a little bit of space. It kind of blends in the background of the piece. That's kind of what I used it for. The chorus is on. That's kind of what it's known for. Um, here's it without the chorus. Very plain, but you could use it for a few things. With the chorus, I mean, that's the sound of the 80s. That's why people buy Junos. That's why they're like $2,000, which is crazy on Reverb.com. Um, yeah, uh, number three is this bass sound. And that's programmed in. You know, I did this one. I had played, I played everything by hand. I uh, would go ahead and in the MIDI effect quantize it because I feel like I've noticed I can play close by hand but actually quantizing everything on an electronic piece where things are glitching right on the beat uh, based on the sampler. All of those things are really important to have right, right on the beat. So I played those in, quantized them, and I kind of performed it by muting, unmuting, writing the, writing the filter there. Um, and I used this one in the middle of the song. I think I played it like an octave up as like a fluty thing. I meant to turn the spring reverb up, but totally forgot. So you can see even just triggering things on and off, if you get enough performance from the modules and you have things in mind, stuff gets left out, stuff gets done in the heat of the moment. That's kind of the 
approach to performance. It's less playing notes and more crafting sounds that go together um, and building moments that hit or bring things in and out. Yeah, so I think that's kind of covers track three. I kind of bring that uh, mod wheel back in at the end of it. Um, it's interesting to note, so if you... Um, let me turn that on. This is kind of my main keyboard controller. The uh, local control is off on this, so this will control whatever track the Hermit is set to. And that includes the mod wheel. So if I do the mod wheel now, it doesn't do anything. But if I shift over to track three, I can have it control itself again. So that's, I might make a whole unique video on how to use the Mo Grandmother in kind of a master controller setting because it's a little bit funky. Uh, four is pretty cool. It's this pluck sound, so it's coming mutable instruments, plats being controlled from four, CV, octave. going straight into the Basel Instruments Tromso, which is this cool bit crushy. Probably heard me do that in the video. It's going into this filter. I'm not sure I use a whole lot. Kind of get a filtery sound out of that. Going into the Erica Sense Pico DSP, which is just a little bit of reverb. Actually, no, it's not. Um, the Rhodes uh, sound earlier was going into that. This thing is just pretty dry, maybe a little bit of reverb from the computer. Um, that's where that is. And the only thing left, and this is taking way longer than I thought, is this Dave Smith Instruments. At the start, I have the release really plucky, kind of jives with all the... And as things open up, that is is the decay release on that so yeah so my kind of general approach as you can see is craft some sounds create some melodies and then find uh, kind of some macro controls you know the filter on the Moog the release on the Tetra this Tromso uh, glitchy analog bit crush thing that you can create throughout the song to move the parts around um, and you know doing that in some unconventional patterns can make the glitchiness of a euro rack match with more standard you know three mo uh, not modular three non-modular traditional midi synths and you can kind of craft a whole track that is cool and interesting kind of intrigues your ear and one more thing on the mutable instruments uh, uh, plates, plats, whatever you want to call it. I don't know if you notice here, but this is kind of an accent. So these knobs actually control the uh, the morph control here. So it's like I was sitting here by hand doing that, but it gives a little bit of life as that's going. You know, every note doesn't sound the same. It's a little more realistic. You can even do stuff where you turn off some active steps. So here you have a three piece pattern that's triggered irregularly. So you have really unique patterns. Yeah, so that's kind of my general approach at the moment. These kind of unconventional, a little bit randomized, modular, glitchy patterns that shift over time traditional, you know, kind of 8, 16, 32 bar melodies that uh, align over top of those to give your ear kind of some structure and that four on the floor kick that just kind of drives the song. And that was kind of what I created. Um, if you've made it through the song, you are either really interested or really nerdy, but either way, I appreciate it. Um, and I hope you learned something and enjoyed the music. Thanks a lot.